and we will get to as many as we can at the end. Let's go ahead and get started. Hi, I'm Domni Ticidino. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I hold a master's of public health degree with a focus on health education and harm reduction for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and AAC users. I am an AAC user myself. I have worked with the Autistic Self Advocacy Network, Communication First, and SARTAC, or the Self Advocacy Resource and Technical Assistance Center. I am a young white person with short light brown hair that's shaved on the sides. My name is Cole Sorensen. My pronouns are he, him. I'm a young white person with short dark hair, tinted glasses, and a set in piercing. I hold a degree in special education. I've worked in schools and done a whole lot of direct support work. And I'm currently working as a freelance autism and AAC consultant, doing a lot of public speaking and writing, and working with TH Autism Society in mm. Minnesota as well. So these are our learning objectives. We're going to start by covering what autonomy, self determination, dignity of risk, and harm reduction, or ASTDRA chart, are and how they relate to AAC users. Then we're going to identify and describe the impacts and trauma of denial of ASTDRA chart on AAC users, and how ASTDRA chart can have an ameliorating effect on future trauma. After that, we'll discuss concrete everyday examples of how AAC users can exercise ASTDRA chart. And then, by the end of this presentation, we hope you'll recognize and demonstrate your own role as professionals and supporters in fostering ASPTRHR among the AAC users you support. I'm going to start by defining the terms autonomy and self-determination. These are two very closely related concepts that a lot of people consider to mean the same thing, but I view them as having slightly different meanings. Autonomy is something more abstract. It is somebody's right to be their own independent human being, separate from other people. To treat someone as autonomous means to treat someone with the assumption that they have their own thoughts, preferences, beliefs, and opinions, separate from what those around them think. Self-determination is more of a concrete action. Somebody exercises self-determination when they make their own decisions about the things that affect themselves in their lives. If someone is not treated with autonomy, it's very hard for them to exercise self-determination, and self-determination can help someone assert themselves as an autonomous being. Something that the self-advocacy movement fights for is the right to autonomy and self-determination for everyone, regardless of degree of disability. Even those people who require very high levels of support in their day-to-day -day life can and do exercise these rights in both big and small ways. Everybody has the right to make choices about the things that affect them and decide what they want their life to look like. Let's start with dignity of risk, which is a concept that I hope you are at least a little familiar with, but it's okay if you're not. Dignity of risk is the concept that everyone has the right to take risks and make mistakes, even if those risks could end badly. Here are some examples. One is someone taking a new bus route alone. They run the risk of getting lost. Or someone writes a large check without checking their bank account. The check could bounce. Or someone takes a new job that could get fired. Dignity of risk is something that disabled people, and particularly people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, or IVD, are often denied. We're told that since we need help with certain things or have trouble calculating risks on our own, 
we shouldn't be allowed to take risks at all. And that's a denial of autonomy and self-determination. The next concept I want to talk about is harm reduction. This is a concept that is often talked about in the context of recreational drug use, but I'm going to use an example that probably more of you will know. Have you gone to the grocery store in, say, the last 15 months? Mm. Have you worn a mask? That's harm reduction. Being in a public place during a pandemic is risky. But you wear a mask, you limit your time, you get vaccinated. That's harm reduction. People are going to do risky things, but there are ways to make them less risky without banning them altogether. Feel free to think of other examples of dignity of risk and harm reduction and put them in the chat if you like. These four rights, autonomy, self-determination, dignity of risk, and harm reduction are basic human rights. Everyone has them. They aren't special to AAC users. And they're not special to certain AAC users either. They're not just for adults. They're not just for people who can live quote and quote independently. They're not just for people without ID. They are people without physical disabilities. When you talk about these rights, oftentimes you'll hear that someone is too disabled for that. Nobody is too disabled for human rights. Nobody is too disabled for being treated with basic respect and dignity. These rights are for everyone. And another important thing to remember is that there are no prerequisites for these rights. They are rights that should be afforded to everyone from the start. Nobody should have to prove that they are capable of autonomy. Nobody should have thrown the right to dignity of risk through good behavior. The ways that someone exercises these rights may vary based on their strengths and support needs, but those rights cannot be taken away altogether from a person. People deserve these rights even on bad days, even on days when you're frustrated with them, even on days when you're running late trying to get out the door. And it would be so much faster to just take over and decide for them which shoes to wear instead of waiting for them to make up their mind. These are human rights, not rewards, not reinforcers, not a behavior management strategy. And rights are something you can take away. We're now going to get into the concept of trauma. I'll be talking about trauma and its connection to lack of autonomy and denial of communication support at a mostly conceptual level for these next few slides without getting too in depth on specific examples. What counts and is considered as trauma is a contentious issue subject to a lot of heated debate. While the DSM, for example, only recognizes events involving actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violence is constituting trauma. Other diagnostic tools such as the ICD recognize broader definitions of trauma including complex and developmental trauma, which can stem from a variety of adverse experiences. I have on this slide a quote from Dr. David Spiegel, which reads, trauma can be understood as the experience of being made into an object. The victim of someone else's rage, of nature's indifference, or of one's own physical and psychological limitations. Along with the pain and fear associated with the event come a marginally bearable sense of helplessness, a realization that one's own will and wishes become irrelevant to the course of events." End quote. This quote does a good job of highlighting what distinguishes a traumatic event from a non-traumatic adverse event, namely, the feeling of helplessness and powerlessness that accompanies the event. Even in the absence of a single big event that an outside observer would clearly recognize as traumatic, trauma can occur in response to an ongoing pattern of behavior that attacks someone's personhood and makes them feel helpless and powerless at either an overt or a subtle level.
lack of access to robust communication that is reliably understood by those around you is in itself a traumatic experience. I want to be clear here that this is not that being non-speaking is an inherently negative and traumatic state of being, but it is specifically the lack of access that a non-speaking person has to appropriate communication supports that is harmful. Communication is a fundamental human right, and if a person is denied access to that right, it has a traumatic impact on a person. If we are not presuming competence, if we are constantly speaking to the person in dehumanizing ways that doesn't reflect their capacity to think and understand what's going on around them, this causes harm too. I have a quote on the slide from Carly Fleischman, an autistic person who communicates through typing, who wrote, you know how people talk behind people's back? With me, they talk in front of my back. End quote. In addition, if someone doesn't have access to reliable and robust communication, it can be very difficult for them to report abuse or harm that is occurring. People around them may see them as an easy target for abuse. Again, this is not because any particular disability makes someone inherently more vulnerable, but if people are not given the support they need, that is what can create increased vulnerability. I want to add an important caveat here. Learning AAC takes time. It takes trial and error. If you're someone who supports an AAC user, you've more than likely had been trying a system for a while that didn't work at all or waited longer than you should have, in retrospect, to introduce them to AAC or otherwise made some mistakes or have some regrets that have you wondering if you could have done better. I will admit that I have some of those same regrets with regards to people I've worked with. It happens. When I discuss the traumatic impacts of things like communication and accessibility, of lack of presumed competence, I don't do so with the intent to place blame on anyone. I do believe that most people are doing the best they can with the information and resources they have available. However, it's also important to recognize the impact of those experiences on a person. Use any past mistakes you've made to learn and commit to continuing to improve and find more effective ways to support the person you're working with in accessing full communication. If there's something you regret doing, talk to that person about it. If you did something that ended up causing them harm, acknowledge it and apologize. As someone supporting an AAC user, you can't be expected to have all the answers and do everything right, but you're also in a position of considerable power, and it's something you need to be aware of and use in a accountable and responsible manner. If a lack of autonomy, a sense of helplessness and powerlessness contribute to turning a stressful event into a traumatic one. Then it follows that granting someone autonomy can reduce the traumatic impact of adverse events. I don't know if you all have heard of the concept of ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. These are experiences that can cause trauma symptoms in children and are often discussed as risk factors for future things like mental health problems. Within this framework of ACEs, researchers have also identified what they call protective factors, things that can support a child in coping with these adverse experiences successfully. One of these factors is social emotional competence, which is something that develops through the relationships the child is with others and the interactions they have with their environment. These are skills that people are born with, or are inherently better or worse at. They're factors which the adults in their lives need to support them to develop. Some of the protective factors included in the domain of social and emotional competence include self-esteem, self-competence, self-efficacy, and personal agency. Children need to believe that they are capable of handling things, feel like they have inherent worth, feel like they have power over their surroundings, and have the ability to advocate for themselves. These skills develop through practice. 
they develop through the experience of being put in a situation where they have to problem solve and being given the appropriate supports to solve that problem. They develop through having opportunities to try risky things and learning how to manage the consequences. They develop through many, many instances of telling people no and having them no respected. Being granted autonomy can both minimize the traumatic impact of adverse situations and also help someone avoid adverse situations to begin with. A person given autonomy can advocate for themselves to choose not to work with a particular staff person who makes them uncomfortable. They could set boundaries, say no to things they don't want to do. Of course, just the presence of autonomy is not enough to completely protect someone from harm. Even if a person says no, that's not a guarantee that someone will listen. Abuse is never the fault of the victim, and abuse can happen to anyone. That being said, supporting someone in expressing autonomy and self-advocacy skills in all areas of their lives gives them more tools to identify when something is wrong try to get out of that situation and seek help when needed. We know non-speaking people are at greater risk of harm, abuse, and trauma than speaking people. This is especially true for non-speaking people with IDD. There is a line from a great paper by Brian and Moulton that I think is appropriate here. We know that the best victim is one you can't tell. If someone has no effective communication, they have no way of telling. Lack of access to communication is traumatic itself. Cole already went over this, but it's worth repeating. When you can't tell people what you want to, when they talk past you as if you're an object, not a person, when their words make it clear they don't see you as human in the same way they are, that is traumatic. And many AAC users experience this for years, if not decades, before they find effective communication. That is trauma. And if you have no other way of communicating, you communicate through gestures and movement. If your only way to say no is to push someone away, you do that. But gestures and movements that other people don't like get labeled as challenging behavior and often end up with the person subjected to years of harmful, abusive therapies to fix their behavior. So the trauma compounds, AAC systems, and that includes recognizing gestures and movements as a form of communication, give people more ways to communicate and clearer ways to communicate. It is easier for people to communicate complex ideas if they have an AAC system that both they and people around them can understand. Pushing someone away is a fine way to say no, but it's much harder to communicate something like I don't like it when you touch my face to clean me up without asking first. There is also the need to communicate abuse or harm. Oftentimes, if someone is acting out because they are being abused, that behavior is interpreted as something to eliminate. And many so-called therapies, particularly for children with IDD, explicitly label non-compliance as something to be stopped. If you give someone a robust communication system, they are able to communicate more clearly that something is wrong. The best victim is one who can't tell. Make sure they can tell. This does not end the risk of harm, abuse, and trauma. That is not the point of harm reduction. We live in a world where people with communication disabilities are at increased risk of abuse, and that is a bigger problem than any one person. But effective communication means people are less likely to be abused, less likely to be abused long term, more likely to be able to say no clearly when they are being abused, and more likely to be able to report abuse. I know there's an impulse for supporters of AAC users to want to keep them away from harm, always, particularly when we are talking about parents and their children. But zero harm, zero risk is not a meaningful goal. It wouldn't be a good goal even for a non-disabled person. The goal needs to be less risk, giving someone tools to be safer when they go out into the world. 
and that starts with effective communication. Let's start this off by making it very clear. Nobody is too disabled for self-advocacy. There is no disability that renders people incapable of having wants, needs, hope, goals, and humanity. Everyone can utilize autonomy, self-determination, dignity of risk, and harm reduction, no matter who they are. AAC users with higher support groups need these rights taught to them and their supporters just as much, if not more, than people with lower support needs. It is really easy to say, well, that person needs full-time care, or that person isn't able to reliably signal yes or no, so they don't need these rights. But that is not true. AAC users with high support needs are routinely dehumanized and treated less like human beings and more like objects. It is so important that when you work with people with higher support needs, you are very deliberate in making clear these rights, that you hold yourself and others accountable to honoring these rights. There are ways to boost someone's autonomy, self-determination, dignity of risk, and harm reduction skills even if they don't have a reliable communication system. You can offer someone choices, even if they can't reliably signal one. You can include them in conversations about their care, even if they can't reliably communicate their ideas. Even if someone can't tell you where they want to go on a day out of their community, you can still take them different places and try to see which ones they like best. Presume competence. There are two facets to this. The first is that everyone has something to say. Every person is full of things they want to communicate. Just because someone has no reliable communication system does not make them incapable of having something to say. Everyone can think. Everyone has ideas. The second part of this is that everyone can communicate with the right supports. For some people, that support is going to be a device they can touch with their hands or another body part. For some people, it's going to be a letterboard and coral word point. For some people, it's going to be an IGA system. For some people, it's going to be learning a signed language and using it as their primary language. But everyone can communicate so long as they have the right supports. It's a matter of finding the supports that work for them. Another part of this is recognizing when someone is already expressing autonomy and support them to build on that. So if you have someone who can't move much of their body voluntarily but can raise their eyebrows and squeeze their eyes closed, you can work with them on developing a yes slash no system based on that. Behavior is a very important way that people express autonomy too. Especially if someone doesn't have another form of communication that's reliably understood by others. Behavior is a vital way that they communicate their autonomy and preferences. If someone keeps consistently shutting down and refusing to engage in a certain activity, they are communicating something about that activity to you. Non-compliance is a form of self-advocacy. It's a form of boundary setting, as much as it may feel like an inconvenience to you. A lot of people have this idea that something like non-compliance in a non-speaking person is something that always needs to be addressed through behavior interventions to get them to comply. But think of it this way. Sure, everyone in life is to do things in life that they don't enjoy sometimes. But think about in your own life, when you're faced with a task you hate, what your options are. If it's a task at work, you have the option to quit that job find a new job where you're happier. If it's a chore, you have the option to talk to your partner or roommate or whoever. Tell them, look, I really hate vacuuming. Can you take over the vacuuming if I fold laundry? You have the freedom to ask for help, to negotiate, to set limits. For the person you're supporting, they may not have access to all these same options. Oftentimes, their only option 
when faced with a task they don't want to do is non-compliance. It might be frustrating, and you might feel like it makes things difficult for you, but try to change the frame through which you're viewing the behavior and recognize this for what it is, a way that the person is asserting their autonomy, preferences, and personhood with the best tools that they have available to them. Help them build on ways to say no in those moments, to ask for help, to let you know what they would prefer to do. They have the same rights as you do to self-determination, even if the ways they express it are different. How do these concepts of autonomy, self-determination, dignity of risk, and harm reduction translate to an AAC intervention context? We'll look at autonomy first. One component of autonomy is bodily autonomy and bodily autonomy is taken away through techniques such as hand over hand instruction. If you're grabbing someone's hand and manipulating it for them, for example, moving their hand to make them touch a particular button that infringes on their right to control what happens with their body. But yes, for some people, physical instruction is really important for them to be able to learn. If you determine that someone needs physical instruction, First, always ask consent before touching them and watch for any behavior that might signal that it's not okay. And then, instead of putting your hand over theirs, put your hand under it and guide action that way. This modification means that they can pull their hand away at any time if they choose. Limiting access to an AFC system also violates someone's autonomy. You should treat someone's AAC system like an extension of themselves, because it is a part of them. It's their voice. They have control over it. It's not something that you should be taking away. They should have constant access to that system. Moving on to self-determination, the right to make your own decisions. I want to talk here about the concept of modeling. Using AAC to communicate with someone with the intention of demonstrating or teaching it. As part of self-determination, people have the right to decide for themselves what they want to say using their device. If you are modeling AAC and expecting the person to copy what you are saying, or withholding an item until they copy a modeled word or phrase, you're not giving them the right to choose for themselves what they want to say, and you're teaching them that AAC is just another task where they have to memorize expectations and comply with instructions. Modeling is incredibly important for AAC learning, but that modeling should take the form of just communication of one half of a conversation. Think of it as language immersion rather than leading memorization drills. Self-determination is also impacted if you're choosing the vocabulary in someone's system based on what you want them to say. The person should be involved in this process, especially when it comes to French vocabulary. People should have access to the vocabulary they want in order to talk about their interests. For people who are able to spell, you can teach them to program in words to their own device, but for people who cannot, there are still ways to involve them. Pay attention to what seems to interest them and ask them questions like, do you want more words to talk about cars? If that's something they have a hard time answering, show them examples, let them try things out, watch how they react and respond to different options. People can make their preferences known in so many different ways if you take the time to listen. vocabulary connects to the concept of dignity of risk as well. People are often reluctant to add in any so-called rude language to someone's AAC system. They'll say, oh, well, we shouldn't be teaching them that. They might use it inappropriately. It might be a distraction. They might hurt someone's feelings with it. Sure, that's true. But that can be said for just about any kid when they learn a word like that which they will eventually. There are risks with the ability to use certain words 
but those are risks that people have the right to take. We'll get more into this in the labor section too. Dignity of risk also means not confiscating an AAC system just because there is a risk of it being used as a distraction or the system being damaged. It means allowing access to that system even when there might be risk involved. Of course, when you're talking about dignity of risk, you should be implementing harm reduction at the same time. Often when people don't grant dignity of risk, it's because they're not considering the harm reduction strategies that make dignity of risk feasible. So going back to the concept of allowing access to an AAC system, given in situations where there's risk of damage to that system. Also think about what harm reduction strategies you can put in place to minimize those risks. If someone throws their device when they get upset, getting a more of a case can be a form of harm reduction. If you're going to the pool, a waterproof case while in the, and a low tech backup while in the water is harm reduction too. Another important aspect in harm reduction is teaching the user how to use the system safely, keep it from being damaged and repair when things go wrong. What this instruction looks like will vary based on the system and the user, but the basic principle of make sure they can use their system safely and troubleshoot if something goes wrong remains. Part of fostering autonomy and self-determination for AAC users means giving them tools to fix problems if something goes wrong. Now we're going to talk a little about this for the communication rights that your students have in their relationship to ASDD or HR. We're going to use the Communication Bill of Rights as a framework. The Communication Bill of Rights was created by the National Joint Committee for the Communication Needs of Persons with Severe Disabilities in 1992. It was developed to address the systematic barriers that many non-speaking people face that prevent them from accessing robust communication and equal participation in society. These rights are ones that all people have, but they are especially important to talk about for non-speaking people, as they are often denied these rights far more often than non-disabled people are. We're going to look at several of these rights more in depth. And I will tie each of these rights to an overall principle that should guide your work with the AAC users you support. The first few rights I wanted to discuss all have to do with the concept of presuming competence. Presuming competence, which means treating someone with the assumption that they can understand what's going on around them, even if you're not sure if they can is foundational for autonomy and self-determination and an essential practice when working with AAC users. People have the right to know about the people in their lives and everything happening to them. A lot of times professionals look at a non-speaking person and assume that they aren't aware of the things going on around them. They assume that the person won't notice who's working with them or they would never understand what people around them are doing, and so nobody needs to bother explaining it to them. But there's no way for you to know how much a person really understands or is taking in about their environment. Even someone labeled as profoundly disabled deserves to know what's going on around them. If someone's regular staff person is out sick, introduce them to the substitute staff. Let them know why there's someone you working with them and for how long. If someone has food on their face, tell them, hey, looks like you got some stuff on your face. Is it okay if I wipe that off for you? And make every effort to give them an opportunity to respond in whatever way before you do it. This applies to big changes that affect them too. If a student's schedule is changing, Maybe they'll be spending more time in the mainstream classroom or less time there. Talk to them about that. Explain why the change is happening, what that means for them, and what the plan is for the future. Every person deserves to be informed about changes to their lives, both big and small, regardless of their disability. People have the right to be treated with respect, to be talked to and not about and to be taught with in a way that they understand. 
what do you think it would feel like to constantly be surrounded by professionals talking about you like you're not there? This is a conversation that I once saw take place between a classroom teacher and a new power educator about a non-speaking student with Down syndrome while the student was sitting right there. A few details have been changed to protect the student's privacy. This is Josh. You need to be careful with him. He likes to steal from other students. He's had a big problem with stealing his whole life his parents are really worried about it. He's not toilet trained, so he wears diapers. He doesn't always let you know when he needs to get changed, so if he starts to smell or starts acting cranky, you might need to take him to the bathroom. What do you think it was like for Josh to sit there and hear people talk about him that way? Do you think he would feel like his teacher and pair care about him as a person, that they like him and believe that he can succeed? Being talked about in that way would be absolutely humiliating to anyone. And if you've had a lifetime of experiences like that, it's hard to feel good about yourself as a person. It would make a huge difference if that teacher had had the conversation like this. Josh, I'd like to introduce you to the new para. She's going to start working with you soon. I've told her a little about you already and what we're working on as far as communication goes. I mentioned to her that we've been practicing asking for a bathroom break lately, and you've been working hard on that. Is there anything you'd like to tell the new pair about yourself? A conversation like that would feel completely different from the one I shared before. When talking to non-speaking people, or anyone with a developmental or intellectual disability, use clear and direct language, but don't be patronizing. I went to the doctor a few months back for an ear infection. The doctor looked in my ear and then, speaking as one adult to another, told me, Oh no, Archie. I bet that really hurts. Huh, buddy? My device can't properly convey his tone. But believe me, it was the kind of overly sweet voice that you would only otherwise use when talking to your pet. Talk to a non-speaking person in an age-appropriate way. I'd also really encourage you to limit the number of nicknames, high fives, and fist bumps you use. Those get old quickly. If someone often initiates high fives, by all means, give them one. But phrases like high five, buddy, often follow us throughout every interaction we have and can get incredibly tired. These rights have to do with autonomy. People have the right to say what they feel and think. That applies even if what they choose to say is leave me alone, I hate you, or maybe even fuck off. That doesn't mean that you have to like what they say and what they say might have consequences, but that doesn't take away the right to have access to those words. If someone's peers are making bathroom jokes or swearing, are talking about sex. That person deserves the right to join in on those conversations just like any other person. Non-disabled kids learn through experience about when it is or isn't appropriate to say something and what the consequence of their words might be. Would you rather have someone learn from you that it's not okay to tell someone to go to hell? Or would you rather they learn the lesson many years later when they say it to their boss or a stranger at a bar? or a police officer. Also, make sure that the person you're supporting always has the right to say no. No is one of the most important words for someone to have, especially if they're not speaking. If you have to start by teaching just one word to the person, I always recommend you start with the word no. People need the ability to set boundaries and self-advocate, and saying no to something they don't want to do is a great place to start. I'm going to talk a little bit about sexual abuse here, just as a heads up. If that's a topic that is distressing for you, please do what you need to do to take care of yourself. People with developmental and intellectual disabilities are taught their whole lives to comply with what they are told. Professionals tell us what they want from us, and we are expected to comply. 
even if we don't want to, for non-speaking people. Often the only way we have to show that we don't want to do something is through behavior. And the behavior is punished until we stop it and do what we're told. We learn that we need to do what someone tells us to do, no matter how uncomfortable it makes us. Is there any surprise then that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are over seven times more likely to be sexually assaulted, according to the U.S. Justice Department? When you look at women with intellectual and developmental disabilities specifically, they are 12 times more likely to be sexually assaulted than someone with no disability. Many times these assaults are perpetrated by someone in a position of power over the person, like a family member, caregiver, or professional, by teaching disabled people that they have the right to say no when they are uncomfortable with something. We help. Teach them that they have power over their bodies and that nobody should force them to do something they don't want to do. You should make every effort to respect someone saying no. Talk to them about what their choice means. For instance, if someone is refusing to eat lunch, explain that they might be hungry the rest of the day, but leave the choice ultimately up to them. In the case of an immediate safety issue, or when the person's actions are violating the rights of someone else, you might have to intervene despite the person telling you no, but talk to them afterwards and explain it to them. Don't teach the people you support that a person with power over them has the right to force them to do something they don't want to do. These next several rights have to do with self-determination. People have the right to ask for what they want, who they want, and where they want to go, and they have the right to make their own real choices. It isn't a real choice if you are deciding for them while their options are in only giving them access to the options you want them to choose. If you say to them, what do you want to do at recess? Play on the swings or the slide? And only show them those two picture cards to choose between you're not really letting them choose. What if the person wants to play tag with their classmates or collect rocks and sticks or even just stay inside because they're not feeling well today? If you only give them those two picture cards, they have no way of communicating what they really want. Make suggestions if you want, but always make sure the person has a way to let you know that they don't want to do any of your suggestions. When you don't limit someone's choices, there will be times when they ask for something that they can't have. Maybe you ask them what they want for a snack and they request cookies when all you have is carrot sticks and pretzels. Maybe they come up to you over and over again and tell you they want to see their mom. No matter how impossible the request or how frequently they ask it, don't ever ignore that person's communication. Whether you respond with a patient explanation or even just telling them not right now, you need to listen and respond. That person has had a lifetime of experience of trying to communicate their thoughts and not being understood or recognized. Don't add to that stress and frustration. Make sure that person knows that their voice matters to you and that you will listen to what they have to say, even if you can't give them what they want. These next two rights are about dignity at risk, even if they don't immediately look like you. AAC users have the right to have our friends and social life and to be a part of our communities. A person with very high support needs still has the right to go to the park, for example, and they have the right to do that even if it's risky. And things like making friends, socializing, getting to know people, doing things in one's community. These are all risky. They are things that AAC users and other disabled people may struggle with more than our non-disabled peers. But we still have the right to try. And we have the right to keep trying. Just because it doesn't work out once doesn't mean we lose the right to friendship, to socialization, to community. Sometimes AAC users are kept away from our communities because people are afraid if we go out, 
will get bullied by others for being different. This line of quote and quote logic is the same as one of the ones that gets used to keep disabled students in segregated, sheltered classrooms, away from non-disabled peers, and disabled adults in sheltered workshops, group homes, and other kinds of institutions their whole lives. But being around people who are different from you is part of life. We live in diverse communities. Disability is a natural part of life, just like any other facet of identity. And punishing AAC users for what others have done to them, or what others might do to them, is blaming the victim. Yes, being part of the community is risky, but that doesn't make it appropriate for AAC users. We have the right to try, the right to fail, and the right to learn from our mistakes in the community. Let's talk about a couple of rents related to harm reduction. Earlier, we talked about how AAC itself is a form of harm reduction. Another core component of harm reduction is that people have the right to information and tools that would make potentially risky situations less dangerous. People have the right to have their communication system and other tools available to them, to have them working and to be with people who know how to set up, use, and fix their communication system. People deserve constant access to communication, but for AAC users, this is so rare naturally provided. I've heard plenty of stories of people having their communication devices confiscated in hospitals that have no electronics policies. But confiscating a communication device isn't just taking away the device. It's taking away someone's entire ability to speak, akin to taking someone's mouth shut so they can't talk at all. Confiscating a communication device from a non-speaking person is doing exactly that same thing. Access to communication is not a privilege that you can take away, no matter what the circumstance. For a similar reason, it's important that you understand the basics of how to work with the communication systems of anyone you support. This isn't to say that you need to be a technical expert in who can fix any glitch the person may experience, but you need to at least know how to turn it on, charge it, adjust the volume, find most of the words to make a sentence, and that is a button on you. If you work with an SLP or assistive tech expert, they should be able to assist you. Another facet of access and harm reduction is giving people access to information. A lot of times professionals working with an AAC user do a great job of teaching the person how to make requests, but stop there. People need to have the vocabulary and support to also ask questions, answer questions, and share information. If a communication system lets a person say, I want more crackers, but it doesn't let them say something like, it's really, really hot in here and the music is so loud that I'm about to have a meltdown, and that person doesn't have full access to communication. It might be that the person doesn't use all that vocabulary right away, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't be available for the person to use. You may not be the one doing most of the customization or editing on someone's device. But you can still be an advocate for your person if you see that their communication system doesn't have all the vocabulary that they need. We've been joined by a second co-presenter, Evie, who's our cat. Hopefully she won't be too involved, but if you saw a big ball of ground fluff, that's her.
back to the presentation. So this is a slide of ways you can help ensure that the AAC users the support of access to the rights of autonomy, self-determination, dignity of risk, and harm reduction. This is not a comprehensive list. There are always more ways. First, be explicit and deliberate when you talk about these rights. Be clear that they are human rights, that everyone has them, that nobody is too disabled for them. Like we've talked about, it is easy for people to set aside or trample over these rights when helping someone with high support needs or when they're rushed for time. But rights come first, no matter what. Tell your colleagues and other supporters about these rights. Show them the video of this presentation if you like. Take what you've learned here and explain how they can help ensure these rights in the lives of the AAC users they support. Ask the AAC users you support how they would like you to support them in these ways. They may not understand all the terminology in this presentation, especially if they are younger, but that's okay. The Communication Bill of Rights, especially the versions that are written for young AAC users, is a good place to start here. You can go through each right on the Communication Bill of Rights and ask the person how they would want you to help them. Highlight and name the ways you see these rights being respected or disrespected in your work. Hold yourself and others accountable when you see someone disrespecting one of these rights. I know it can be really hard to have the courage to do that. We live in a system where it is difficult to hold accountable people with more social standing than me, but it's a necessary process. Also, work with the AAC users you support so that they can also name and call out ways they see their rights being respected or disrespected. Self-advocacy is not an innate talent. It is a skill people have to learn and practice. Help the AAC users you support to brainstorm things they can say or do if someone is not honoring their rights. We've left the last bullet point as an ellipsis so you can brainstorm your own. These also were very general ideas. You can think of more specific examples. But it's worth remembering that everyone has a role to play here. Nobody can be perfect. Nobody can do everything. But everyone can do something. All right, we have a few minutes for one or two questions now. We will be responding on our AAC devices, so we ask your patience while we compose our answers. We will get to as many questions as time allows. We have also provided our email addresses on the slide in case we do not have time to get to your question or if you'd like to reach out otherwise. My email is cole.m.sorensen at icloud.com and Donnie's email is cdgnome at gmail.com. We'll also be sticking around in the Slack channel for a bit after the presentation and can answer any questions we don't get to there. Okay, we can take some questions now.
Catherine asks, how do you handle it when all these? Yeah. P, <laughs> doesn't respect your communication rights? <laughs> That's a big question. I hired my own direct support professionals now because I've had such a hard time finding staff people who will treat me with respect. I now have someone who I trust, who I'm able to have conversations with when something isn't working for me. And I don't feel like my rights are respected. Amy asks, which of the rights on the Bill of Rights are the most poignant to you personally? I would say the right to have information, to both give it and receive it. I work as a journalist and a technical writer on plain language publications, and I know just how little accessible information, especially on complex topics, there is for disabled people. Having a system that allows someone to exchange information means that they can also ask for help if they don't understand information. That's all we have for you today. Thank you everyone for attending, and we really enjoyed getting to present to you all today. Again, feel free to reach out with any questions, and thank you again for coming. And that is going to conclude our presentation. Thank you all for coming to this really, really important session.